Hello, good morning. We're here to present Smart Ports, Peers of the Future. Today at 12, 12.15, and 12.30, we have three of the most important projects of Smart Ports, Peers of the Future. And also a reminder that tomorrow, at the same time, at 12 o'clock until 12.45, we'll also have the three other most important projects, the total of six projects. With us now, we have Piet Obstale, the Innovation Lead of Port of Antwerp. He's here to present Drones Open Innovation. Open Innovation Platform to accelerate the development and testing of the drone technology. Results will be explained during the presentation. Thank you. Hello, good morning everybody. Um, for some of you, it's the second round, but uh, I will bring another story than the first one. Um, so I'm, I'm Pitt, work in the Port of Antwerp. Um, I think about three years ago, we, we started about innovation uh, in a broad sense, focused mainly on technology innovation. Do you hear me? Because I hear a lot of uh, noise around me. Is it okay? Okay. Um, we start working on technology innovation uh, because today, or, or already for a while, a lot of innovation is possible. Uh, innovation is only a means to something. But uh, we focused on, on some technologies. In total, 10. Uh, I, I presented uh, half an hour ago about digital twin. Now I will do that on drones. But actually, at that moment, the idea came also up that we should, um, in a period of accelerating technology, should be much more open and bring in uh, technology companies also in the port business, because the port business needs technology to make that digital transition possible. So, um, but first, a short introduction on the port of Antwerp itself. Uh, and looking from an innovation point of view, there are a few challenges. Uh, first of all, it's the area, oh, it's the area, it's 120 square kilometers. It's one of the largest port areas in the world. Uh, six times the city of Antwerp. Uh, um, and, and that's a challenge, because the activities going there, a big, a lot of activities around. There is a big, uh, the second largest chemical hub in the world is there. So you have a lot of processes and activities going around. So being as a port authority, being able to monitor that in an efficient way is important. And we can and we should use technology for that. Another one, nobody is living inside the port. Every day, 60,000 people are coming in and out of the port. So they're looking to safety, security, but also mobility is an uh, important element. And we have a lot of companies active in the port. So one of the ideas also, if everybody has to go through that learning curve, right, because some technologies are complex. Right? If you talk about AI, artificial intelligence, everybody say, oh, what's that? And indeed, you have machine vision, you have your deep learning, and so on. There are different aspects on. But if every company uh, in the port, and I think that in general, has to go through that learning curve, what is that technology? Which are the good companies? How can I, should I do a proof of concept? Should I do a proof of value? Should I do a pilot? Uh, that will take an enormous amount of, of effort and time. So as a port authority, we try to facilitate that, to say, hey guys, we will, uh, we will do that. And, and we choose some technologies which can be relevant for the port operations, for the port business. And we will help you in making that transition. And actually, uh, I told you already two years ago, the idea came up of that innovation platform. It's not the best name. If somebody has a better one, uh, because people say uh, innovation platform. It's, it's, uh, it's a kindergarten, or is it a play, a play field, a living lab? No, no, it's about business, yeah, because innovation is about in creating new value. It's in creating new business, business of the future. If, we, if you don't believe in that, uh, and that's a little bit, uh, sometimes the connotation which is made with the uh, open innovation platform, people I think uh, these guys are just playing. Okay? Every day I say to my team, where is the value? If we cannot show the value, it's over, it stops. I experienced that in my previous life uh, because there it was in fast moving consumer electronics, uh, navigation systems, and there every four years the market completely changed, completely. Uh, uh, Siemens Video, Blaupunt, they just lost in, in one year time 50% market share. There was only one reason lack of innovation. But okay, that's a, for another time. Next year I will bring that story. Um, 
so but, but in the port business, uh, and in Antwerp specifically, what do we have? As a port authority, we have 1.6 billion euro of assets in the port. Uh, uh, bri bridges, locks, uh, buildings, uh, so asset, uh, assets. Uh, we are in a period of fast evolving technology, uh, exponential growth of technology. You should not underestimate that. Eh? But, uh, it's, it's, there's a big difference between linear growth and exponential growth. So today, we are in, in the last five to 10 years, uh, and if you look to AI, exponential growth of uh, technology. I think innovation is too much approached from a problem point of view. What are your problems? I will solve your problem. That's maybe good, but you only make small steps, eh? baby steps, ad hoc solutions. What we believe is you should think, look to your platform, look to your resources, to your assets, to your people, and how, what's the potential of that platform, and use that. And the last one um, is about platform thinking. Uh, today we are very much still in a product pipeline economy. I think in the future, the companies who will survive, will companies who will organize themselves in networks, on, in networks, on platforms, because it's proven, uh, Harvard Business Review, if you do that, your product development and your go-to-market is 10 times faster than if you do it on yourself. I uh, always say two people are always smarter than one, eh? always. So organize yourself in networks. So based on that ID, uh, we came up with a quite extreme uh, statement uh, more than uh, about three years ago. Let's open the port for everybody, uh, technology companies in the first place. Everybody is welcome, do your thing, and we see what's happening. Uh, must be fantastic, eh? if you can do that, just say technology, here, develop your products, test your products, uh, bring them to operational level, and, and you have a, a great uh, in size, you have a massive platform available for you. Of course, you, can, you cannot organize that, eh? it would be chaos, eh? probably within two days, your locks will not open anymore. So we choose actually three topics uh, to work on, and it's drones, smart shipping and air quality. Because we believe these are technologies which are fast evolving, uh, but which can also create a lot of value for the port and can bring that operational improvements, efficiency, uh, but also bring a safer environment, more secure environment into the port. Coming to this slide here, how do we do that? And in and, and that way, it's very nice to work for a, a port authority because we own these assets, uh, so we can support technology companies in providing hard infrastructure, hardware. Uh, I'll give you the example on smart shipping. Uh, there we provide a dock where technology companies can do testing of auto smart ships, autonomous ships, in all safety. Uh, it can be digital uh, infrastructure, and that could be data, or that could be a communication network. Uh, for the drone uh, project we did, uh, Proximus, the, the Belgium, uh, one of the Belgium telecom operators, they installed two new uh, uh, pilots, uh, pilots, because these drones are flying on 90 meters, and a 4G network normally only reaches 40 meters. So we provide an infrastructure to these drone companies. And last but not least, processes, eh? because that's sometimes forgotten. Eh? If you introduce new technology, you should also define which process will be used, because if tomorrow a smart ship is coming to the port of Antwerp, an un unmanned ship, it will be a completely different process than it is today. Why? Uh, there is no captain anymore. So it's not a captain, you have to move uh, five meter left or right. No, it will be a completely different process. So that's a little bit um, as an introduction. Um, why are we working on drones? Uh, I think we are working on about two years, a little bit less than that. Um, because we believe that drones still need a big development. I think the hardware is there for most of the parts, but if you look to the applications, uh, there are a lot of companies uh, active on that. There are a lot of drone companies, by the way. I think in Belgium, 500. In France, 6,000. In the UK, 7,000. So, I don't know, in China, maybe, I don't know, 10, I don't know. Probably in the world, there are 50, 100,000 companies every day building new solutions, new technology on drones. So forget, forget about it that you can capture that knowledge. And that's the reason that you say, hey guys, come to us, we are an open innovation platform, bring solutions. We will not look for solutions, bring solutions. So um, um, 
we, we think one and a half years ago, we listed up what are the potential use cases uh, for drones in a port. And we ended up with more than 40 use cases. Right? And that's about um, 3D mapping, it's about oil spill detection, security, um, depth measurements even, quality measurements, air quality measurements, water quality. So you have so, uh, stock inventorization. So you have so many potential use cases that we say we should leverage on that technology. And one of, one of the, the big projects there was the software project. There's a new European sponsored project where, you know, in Europe, uh, the drone legislation is still organized per country. Uh, so Spain, France, Belgium has their own drone legislation. As a, as a Spanish uh, pilot, you cannot fly in Belgium. You need a homologation. So too complex, very cumbersome for a technology where they predict that by 2030, there will be in the city of Paris, 25,000 flights a day. Uh, Amazon says, if 1% of our deliveries will be done by drones, then we talk about 100 million flights a year. So it's a technology which has a massive potential acceleration. So um, we are in that, uh, in that country related legislation and Europe say we should come as fast as possible to European legislation, yeah, so that the also Spanish pilot can fly in Belgium and, and the other way around. And for that, they set up that project, and that was a consortium of uh, six, seven companies. Yeah. So the telecom operator was there. We had uh, uh, Skies, which is the, the, the airspace management system in, uh, operator in Belgium. We had Unifly, a startup who is developing software for airspace management for drones. Yeah. And you see that that innovation is even uh, having influence on manned aviation because today some operators are looking to use the drone uh, airspace management system for manned aviation right? because uh, manned aviation, I don't know the details, but it's still technology from the 80s. So these guys, they need a major, techno if somebody from the business, we can discuss, but they need a major technology upgrade. And you see there from a new business coming in, drones that can happen from there. So um, the European also, uh, not to forget, also Amazon joined that uh, project. Uh, why? They say, yeah, but for us it's important to see how that is working. If you put multiple um, drones at the same time in a complex operational environment, right? because the port of Antwerp, we have the highest concentration of Civeso companies in, in Europe. Uh, so there is a lot of restrictions and, and safety regulations necessary there. We have here uh, the airport of Antwerp. It's a small airport, but okay. Yeah? So that's the entrance here to that airport. Of course, we have the city. So uh, we say to the project, hey guys, we are your, we are your guests. Please come to the port of Antwerp and do there your testing. So the testing happened actually six weeks ago. Yeah? So at that moment, the initial target was to have 15 flights at the same time, within two hours, to see how these things are interacting. Yeah? Because you need, if, if something goes wrong, you need to be able to interfere and so on. I can assure you it was a preparation for more than one year to get all approval. Horrible stories. Uh, the minist minister has to sign, actually, in his own responsibility, to take responsibility if something goes wrong. Yeah? Uh, only two hours before we were starting, but uh, with these projects, these kinds are happening. So here you see one of the fly, a uh, few of the flight uh, trajects uh, uh, lines which were happening. So we learned a lot of that. Uh, Amazon was combining their airspace management with the one of Unifly and see how they can be combined and interact so that new drone flights can be used. So I think. Um, Maybe the weather, and there you see the sensitivity of drones. The weather, the weather was not very comfortable. There was a lot of wind, uh, four or five before, and there was a lot of rain that day uh, we did the testing. So instead of 15 flights, we could do only 10. But okay, that's also a learning process. Eh? If you see that drones, some drones, uh, it's hard to fly above five before, yeah, that, that's a takeaway. But as such, the, the, the project was a success, and I think the learning the report has been made now. So, and Europe, that's a new space, space program. Europe will now, next year, release the first version of their legislation. And by the way, it's a good example where everybody say about yeah, innovation. Not possible. Why? Yeah, the, the law doesn't allow and too much regulation, blah, blah, blah. It's a very good example where legislation 
is pushing innovation. Because it's Europe who say, hey guys, you need to do these tests, how, what the behavior is of these drones at the same time. So we can learn out of that and we can build and create a decent legislation, European legislation. So I think it's one of the few, the few examples I know, but I think it's a very good example where legislation is pushing innovation. So what we, um, and, and being an open innovation platform, what we also did is say, hey guys, because you need a control, com, a comment control center, um, we had a building which was not used, uh, which was equipped with uh, six of these uh, seats, uh, fully connected and fully redundant with a lot of screens and so on. So um, for one week, that was the, the, the control center where all these startups and companies were working in preparation and execution of the different uh, flights. You see here, for instance, some screenshots uh, how the, the use space, the airspace uh, is working. It was really exciting to see there 30, 40 people working together on that project. Um, I will give you a small movie. It's in Dutch, but there are English subtitles uh, on the results of the project. Yeah, the movie is taking I think, three or four minutes. So what you see is the different uh, drone companies presenting their solutions. So here you see one of uh, Amazon. Every drone had a tracker. Of course, you should be able to identify where the drone is. Huh? <coughs> yeah, it's For some reason, I think we can't hear the sound of the video. Just a second. Yeah. The Cesar Safir uh, flying demonstrations are here to demonstrate uh, UTM and airspace integration for drones, uh, drone technologies. And uh, we're flying over, over the river, over the port in various different scenarios. <laughs> see over here are the several screens that we will be using. Of course this is regarding the cameras and the harbour itself for security reasons. Next to that we have the meteo where we can follow rain uh, and wind. This is the Unifly system. You can already see something happening. Those are manned aircraft that are uh, in, the, in the vicinity. So this is a bit the entire setup we have and show the ecosystem of U-Space and Unifly working in an actual live environment. Radar. Uh, it's an L-band system here and it's designed to actually illuminate an area uh, in front of us to be able to see all the things which, uh, which are in this field of view. So this screen here is now showing the live tracks with the radar is reporting. Yeah, it's uh, looking over a 90 degree and in that 90 degree it is showing all the tracks it is able to see here. And here in this project here we're really excited there are a whole host of very relevant scenarios which are being flown. And we will see how quickly the radar is able to identify the drone and be able to report it. What will happen later on today is that uh, we will create a no drone zone area by simulating a chemical accident. It means that the flight which is ongoing here from Seastral will not be able to return because it will be blocked by the no drone zone and that the Amazon delivery flight by itself will reroute itself to get back to its landing spot. Another flight that will happen today is the flight from Explicit and they will perform an inspection flight in the harbor. What we do is we fly the UAV into the plume from the vessel. You have then the smoke being sucked in here, the plume um, exhaust into this chamber where you analyze it using four different gas sensor data. Transmit all the data to the GCS. Very After 20 seconds, you have the results Very and good. immediately we can contact the authorities if it's a non-compliant vessel that we measure. So um, this is the graph showing the measurement of the plume. 
They refly uh, from clean air directly into the plume from the vessel, stay there for 30 seconds to get a good steady signal, and here we fly out again. We do the analysis 0.09, which is below the, uh, the limit, so it's a, a compliant vessel. Uh, we do a report with all the data. Authority can log on and get the reports, and if they want to be notified with a non-compliant vessel, we can do it. Mm -hmm. And this way we can uh, monitor uh, the exhaust of the vessels and see if they are complied with uh, the rules. <laughs>
quite important as well, we will try to reduce the cost for our uh, stakeholders. This is, at the end of the day, logistics is money talks, quite important. So, what's the impact in terms of the emissions in the poor of Barcelona? Let's, sorry, uh, coming backwards, okay. Well, um, roughly speaking, so the port of Barcelona is roughly speaking uh, uh, emitting 5,000 tons per year in terms of the nitrogen oxides, that it represents a huge amount of emissions. And coming, the majority, most of them are coming from the vessels. It means from the, engine, from the auxiliary engines when they are alongside the berth, uh, burning some fuels and so on. It represents, I repeat, 95%, a lot. The rest are coming from the inland transportation. It means the trucks moving the cargo all around, the vehicles for the, the passengers, sorry, the passengers or the people for uh, some natural purposes and so on, and terminal equipment. Imagine the cranes, the shuttle carriers moving around. This part, it represents, uh, roughly speaking, 5%. We don't, have a lot of, uh, we don't have reliable data in terms of the solid bulk and civil works. It's quite valuable, variable the, within the day. So this is what we are measuring with the different KPIs. Uh, this is a, a study that we get it from the, from the municipality, some public agency, and we grant this information in, in a study in 2015. So, and what's the impact to the city in terms of the port? Roughly speaking, uh, oxide, uh, oxides, nitrogen, it represents around 8% of the whole contribution to the city. And in terms of PM10, the particulate matters, it represents not more than 2%. This is a huge for sure. Um, but imagine for a while the port is not uh, close by the city. So the, the challenge for sure is in the city because it represents a huge, keep in mind how is the impact, for instance, for the cars or the regional contribution, but we are a public body. It's in our duty, it's in our DNA how to reduce this 8% and this 2% of the polluting emissions and oxides, uh, nitrogen oxides to the atmosphere. So when we start to thinking how to how we can reduce this impact, how we can put the focus on improve the air quality in our organization, we thought, well, may maybe we have to, to, to start to identify where are the, the, the most relevant bottlenecks. And we start to thinking that maybe the, one of the main relevant issues it could be use, take into account or taking advantage that we have LNG facilities in the port, promote the, you, the LNG uh, fuels in the poor of Barcelona. Secondly, we thought, why not to construct from the scratch, why not to build up a grid in order to take advantage of the, the different current, let's say, high voltage pipelines, and after that to incorporate renewable resources and so on. We are on the way. The third uh, point is uh, new criteria to attract the cleanest vessels, the cleanest the clean uh, shipping lines which is one of the, the, the ways, granting some um, discounts, rebates in the taxes. And f f more recently, to encourage the maritime business to be a clean par parties in, in this poor business. As a trendsetters, to invite other companies, private and public companies, to, to achieve it. So let's go down to the nitty gritty some, for some specific measures. The first one is, uh, I commented before, supply infrastructure. So what we did as a port of Barcelona, thanks to LNG and gas uh, regasification plan, we have the proper infrastructure. So we did it, we are taking advantage, we, have, we are importing a huge amount of LNG volumes products, and we construct, we redefine the pipe in order to provide uh, this LNG to the, to the vessels and as well to the barge that after that is providing LNG bunkering to the some specific uh, examples that I, will, I, I can explain you or can show you. It's some cruise lines that are in weekly basis calling Barcelona port and where are some different uh, barges providing one different, one specific barge providing LNG to the vessels. Environmental initiative for vessels as commented before, granting the, the maximum discounts as we can as a port authority. Keep in mind the Spanish law is granting nowadays 50% of discount and the berth induced. It, seems, it, it means that the taxes that are paying the vessel using the port area. But on top of that, 
Port of Barcelona is granting an additional 30%. It means 80%. Imagine, 80% discount in, in, in terms to attract the cleanest vessels. It's a huge amount of money, for sure. Regulating uh, LNG bunkering operations. Keep in mind that we are constructing, as, as commented before, we, we build up from the scratch this uh, specific infrastructure. We know we have the, the, the funnel learning with the uh, private companies and so on. And we establish some framework all together knows the rules of play. And this is the reason why we are nowadays, for instance, uh, elaborating some um, ship, track, track to ship or ship to ship bunkering uh, in order to, to achieve it. Some specific uh, pilot projects that we are uh, leadering with private companies in the Port of Barcelona. Mainly focusing in how we are reshaping the mobility from the land side and the sea side. Some examples just to, to be quite uh, shortly, so some examples, for example, for example, how we are reshaping the um, the towage services, the straddle carriers. We are reshaping the engine, the the traditional fuels with a new ones in such a way with LNG. Some trucks, for sure, if we have trucks that are running with LNG, we have to provide sorry, uh, 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 LNG get resification plants. And this, this is something quite important, not just to be in the, in the pictures, not just to be in the media, it's just to breaking down barriers with our uh, stakeholders in order to provide next steps and create a, a, a micro scenario in order to, to go a step forward. So this is from LNG perspective. What we are doing in terms of uh, energy coming from the, from the high voltage uh, pipeline. So we think that it's quite easy at the end of the day. We are trying to provide energy to the, to the vessel from the engines, absolutely engines, and we want to take it from the, highway, from the high voltage pipeline. This is something related how to balance the supply and demand. Nowadays, it doesn't exist. It's a, it's a mass in terms of how we can get it to provide, because this is a huge amount of energy that they requires. So, this is, and after we have uh, analyzed different options, the decision that has been taken is to install, to build up from the scratch, a grid okay, that we will take advantage of the high um, voltage pipeline quite close to the area. We are in, in advanced tools with Red Electric Española in order to provide this, uh, this energy and put it over there to, after that, pr uh, show and, and supply the, the birthing the, the vessels alongside the, the piers. This is as a first step. Okay, so we are constructing this grid. And on top of that, okay, we get it and how we serve, how we supply this energy to the, to the pier area. So we are on tolls, we are thinking uh, how to plan this huge project to provide this comprehensive network to provide this energy to the piers. Which piers are the, the, the decided nowadays. Most of them focusing on the passenger vessel, passenger business. It means cruise ships and ferries. And on top of that, container business and for sure car cargo business. This is a huge amount. This is a great effort of the poor Barcelona. We will invest the estimated cost is around 60 million, 60 million of euro. That this is uh, uh, for sure it's something that we uh, let me underline because it's a, it's a proof that the, the unwavering uh, commitment of this port to provide a better uh, air quality in the port. So this is uh, quite important in such a way. And if you have a, a goal, but you don't have a plan, you have a dream just. So this is the reason why we start to uh, work, hard working in terms of a scheduling to provide this reality in 2017. So, we are showing you the different uh, warfords, the different peers, where are the, the main relevant activities that I mentioned before. Remember passengers, car business, and container business, that for sure, simultaneously, and depending how is evolving the business, it means some specific uh, mobile freights in the maritime business could be ahead of time to other one, we will readapt how we will invest for a specific uh, main uh, decks. So, docks, sorry. This is what uh, we are uh, trying to, to establish or to plan for the next, so, uh, next year, 2020. This is the, the, the huge project. Uh, in parallel, and looking forward, we are thinking about uh, the, 
the renewable resources. We are not just focusing the grid. We are thinking about new projects in terms of renewable resources, mainly photovoltaic. It, does, it, it means that, keep, remember that we are a piece of uh, a landlord system. We are running the poor, these huge premises, where for sure there are some concessioners, and with uh, huge premises where to put some uh, panels, some uh, solar panels, in order to get these uh, renewable resources. For sure, we have to adapt the model that we are running with them, for sure. But the idea is get these uh, renewable resources that for sure the, the, the funny thing or the good thing is that it has no footprint emission. This is quite important to, to underline in order to provide these specific areas. For sure, do you have uh, the, the, the maximum capacity and the demand or the, the consumption that uh, for sure is a huge, that roughly speaking, it represents the majority of the total consumption nowadays in the poor of Barcelona. But on top of that, we are thinking as well for other kind of renewable resources like the, the wind mills or the wind towers, okay? In order to get additional energy that for sure will help in the future. Okay, okay, we have the, the grid where to manage this f uh, few resources in terms of a highway pipeline energy, we have the renewable resources, we have to manage as smart as we can. So we put all together, let's in brackets, in this uh, grid, we have to take into account that we are taking advantage from the different uh, resources, it means for instance the panels or the, the, the windmills and so on. We have to storage this new energy, we have to take into account, we have uh, planning to install batteries in terms of uh, lithium ion batteries that will help. And this grid, the, the, fun, the, the, the key issue is that we'll take decisions from its own, depending on which is the, the relevant f criteria that is involved with. Imagine uh, s supply, demand, cost, what the conditions, different variables that we have to take into account in order to provide Remember, remember, balance the supply and demand depending on the, the, boss, the most efficient and cost orientation. What's the aim at the end of the day? We mentioned at the very beginning in the, in the minutes of, my pre of the presentation, it was quite clear. Minimizing the impact of the, uh, um, of the footprint emissions and the polluting emissions to the, to, to the surrounding area. And for sure, we are focused on in comparison on 2017 to reduce at almost to zero in terms of green, uh, greenhouse uh, um, gases to the in the port area and reduce the uh, nitrogen oxides and particular matters around 50% and 25%. This is a huge effort that we are dealing, not just as a port with uh, private companies and our uh, port community as well. So just before to finalize the, the, the first part of the presentation, we think and we heard uh, before with other colleagues from other poor authorities that we are strong believe that if we are not collaborating with other poor authorities, we cannot achieve the huge challenge that we are facing on. In such a way, and as a proof of that, uh, the, the Port Barcelona at last year to this World Ports Climate Action Program, where, by the way, Port is leading this power to ship, we are the most advanced, advanced and most smart sports all around that, by the way, we are sharing these floors. So, and in such a way, uh, we are putting on the table, uh, let's say as a translators, how we can reduce, how we can decarbonize the port authority, the port business, in order to influence the maritime business. This is something quite important. We have a, small, uh, a short video that is wrapping up that I told you before. It's two minutes, not more. But we know. Well, this is the grid that I mentioned before, where we are building up the superstation. The renewable resources coming from the different panels 
in the different premises of the port. Solar panels. Windmills as well. And for sure how we integrate every single resources in the smartest way from this station, okay, providing depending on the supply and demand. Sorry. To create taking advantage from the different resources, how we for instance, we store this energy and how we are supplying depending on the, every single uh, specific demand. Some cases how we will provide uh, the electric energy to the vessels in such a way. This is a clear example for cruise business. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Thank you very much. So the point is that let me just underline the strong commitment of the Port of Barcelona in order to minimize and to improve the quality air of our surrounding area that for sure will help as well for the surrounding economy. Thank you very much indeed and see you later. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes. Right. We're running a little bit over time. Sorry for that. Our next presenter is Jen Smaya, who's the CEO of the Hamburg Port Authority. He's here to present a project which is about a concrete example of how to optimize the port of the traffic, the traffic port. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Also, there you go. My mic is on. Can you hear me? Sorry. I'm not sure. The micro, yes, yeah, on. Yeah, thank you very much, Napoa. Uh, for the invitation to uh, Barcelona. It's the first time that we are talking about the port and city interface. Um, I think for all of us it's very important. Uh, first of all, I will promise, uh, you know, I'm between you and the lunch break. Uh, right now the large queue over there. And I will try to make it in uh, 10 minutes. But I think it's very important that the interface between ports and cities are well done because traffic jams caused uh, out of the ports because of cruise passengers or container uh, traffic, it's important to avoid and keep the, uh, the, the port in the flow, how we call that in Hamburg. It's very important to make as much money as possible out of the port and keep the city and the state uh, wealthy. And this is uh, what our uh, project is uh, try to telling you. It's a concrete project we have already implemented and it's, uh, you know, how to optimize traffic flows for passenger and goods. I hope it works. Does not work. It's not on. I don't know. Turned it off. Oh. Now. Ah. As you can see on, imagine on this picture, you see on the left side, it's the main station. On the right side is a cruise vessel. The normal distance between the main station and the cruise vessel is approximately 15 kilometers, so it's far away, but the project tries to bring main station and traffic flows closer to the cruise terminals. We had fantastic partners in the project. It's the MIT uh, from Boston and the Hafen City University, so the port and the city. We are always working together with universities and experts to figure out the best way to manage traffic flows. First of all, we uh, try to implement an interactive model. You see on an interactive touch screen a model with, uh, you know, you can put your hands on, you can see the scenery, and uh, the tool is very important that everybody is able to work with it and get in touch and to try to find out, you know, what is the best way uh, of a solution. The use case in this, what I would like to present in the short time, time is cruise business but we can adopt that also to a normal logistic business. Cruise business, or why cruise business? Cruise business is very simple. They normally focus on, you know, check-in processes and land transportation and luggage handling. 
When you look at the total process, it's much more complicated, but we try to start with a, you know, a concrete example, reduce uh, uh, complexity at that time, and uh, try to transform that later. As you can see, the Hamburg main station has, is one of the biggest main stations European-wide, and uh, the speciality is to handle many, many passengers in a very narrow space. That is also for us in the port very important. Our challenge is the port cannot be increased. We always need to keep an eye to use the infrastructure and the, the land in a more efficient way, and it's the same as the, at the main station. The daily parameters, facts and figures, are very important when you start a project. You can see on which side how many passengers per day are moving, and in total, you know, what is going in and out. But I, I wanted to skip that soon. Um, hopefully it works. Yeah. You see at the end, you know, the main station is normally a little bit overcrowded. It is the comfort for the passenger is not perfect. There are jams, there are delays, especially when there is coming a huge amount of cruise passengers at the same time. And then we, we started uh, what we find out. First of all, very important, you need a process definition. And uh, by surprise, you, you start with the uh, impression or the first result is there was no pro process designed at all. So the cruise industry, the main station, the rail operator, the city, they had no idea how the process looks like, so we started you know, to describe some things, what, what are the existing tools, you know, camera systems, transportation, uh, modes of transportation, tourist department, and so on. And then they, you know, we looked who are the shareholders, what are the challenges or problems, what are the first ideas, and then we brought that in a more IT-based uh, model. And here, what you cannot see from the back is, you know, in the center is the main station. Here are people coming from the airport. We figured out they are going from the airport via the main station. There are people who are coming from somewhere arriving at the main station. There are parking areas, logistic areas, and also bus areas. And they all have a combination, you know, at the end with the final destination cruise terminal. And how did we get the data, we did three types of data collection. First thing is, we bought cell phone data from a telecommunication provider in an anonymized way. That means, you know, only if four persons are in a cell, we use that data and we use 10 approaches of three cruise vessels in a port and we try to figure out, you know, what kind of movement we, we saw. You can see here just peaks and lower uh, situation, but that was the first point of data collection. The second one, it's also open to the public. You know, we, we used Instagram photo photographies, and with, uh, you know, picture recognition, you can see if someone takes a picture in the port or on the river, and some moments before he, posts, he or she posted a picture from the city, you can imagine and combine with, uh, you know, data analytics that these people must uh, have visited the city before, the main station, before they went onto the cruise vessel and posted some pictures from the vessel. Open data, that was the second point. And the third thing was a very normal thing. We had questionnaires, we asked passengers how they got from point A to point B. And uh, these three sources, we fitted together or put it together in a so-called agent-based modeling uh, methodology. At the end, we, we figured out we need a micro level and a macro level. The micro level is that we played a little around what are the processes in the, in the cruise terminal, the welcome center. What is going wrong? How long are the waiting times in front of the check-in desk? What about the luggage handling? Is there a traffic jam at the taxi point uh, or you name it? And the other point on the macro level was, you know, what, are, uh, what kind of causes of traffic jams we had from the main station you see located on the, on the right of the picture, moving to one of our three cruise terminals. Delay time, traffic jams in order to um, some uh, facts. And 
you know, I, I do it in a very rapid way. Then we, we put it in, in, in our model. And uh, as you can see here, some movements on switches or regulators. We can play a little. What, what are the results when we change some parameters? For example, when we change, uh, put just a simple thing. You know, two people are receiving luggage at the welcome center at the cruise terminal now. What is the impact when we change that to four people receiving luggage handling or increasing the number of security lines or increasing the check-in counter in the time between 8 and 10 o'clock or something like that? We can simulate and we see the results, you know, and then we saw also um, what kind of results can we um, achieve when we change posi positioning of um, bus stations, for example. Um, when, you, when you have a, a, it's a very small picture, when you see the, the model of the main station, that's the dark gray, and here the normal position where the, where the buses depart to the uh, cruise center, the passengers normally walk out here and have to walk here. What about when we move a bus station over here, or bus departure over there, and the model was able to show that this increases the throughput by, let me say, 20%. And also, we were able to simulate um, when we, ch when we um, order vans instead of taxi. That means combine a single person uh, traffic movement or transportation movement to a, um, let me say, nine person bus. And this kind of model was very, uh, it was very important for us when we created the new traffic system to our uh, cruise terminals. You know, how can we uh, stimulate uh, cruise passengers to, to use public transport, to, uh, to use a uh, clever shuttle or MOYA system, that means small buses, small coaches, which are directly allocated by the cruise lines to the passengers. And at the end, we were able to, to yeah, improve and increase the traffic flow and avoid traffic jams by, uh, let me call it, roughly 30%. So simulation and a concrete example shows us this is uh, part of our future, how we, how we try to implement not just in cruise uh, business and luggage handling, um, how we increase the traffic flow also in uh, our logistic uh, business. You know, we were able to, you would say, manipulate, you know, with short incentives to, to keep the people a little longer at some places or increase number of staff at the cruise terminals with a perfect result. And this is very important. You need the interface between city and port because traffic jam is in the city. Uh, and this is, you know, causes always trouble, and they hate cruise passengers, they, they hate overcrowding and so on. But this was the starting project uh, also for uh, the whole port. In the port and in the city interface, we also have the challenge, you know, if you have a huge number of containers moving through the city, through the motorways uh, to the port, and we are now uh, able to scale up our tools and also share that with our partners in our network, to, to make it usable also to other ports during the next uh, three years, we will increase that container transport port, take away containers from the street to the road, always in, in time windows, in geofences and regions. And I think this is our uh, way to the future, how we can improve you know, the relationship and the partnership between ports and cities. And that's what I would like to show, uh, share today with you and hope this is short enough and uh, you can enjoy now your lunch. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you so much. And um, before you leave, I probably imagined you all really hungry. Um, there's one more presentation right in the other side if you wish to come. It's only going to take about 10, 15 minutes. And um, we're presenting Sergio Dominguez, who's the head of IT of APM Terminals Barcelona. Thank you.